Chemistry is a quantitative science, meaning it deals with measurements and calculations that involve numbers. When working with numbers in science, we deal with two different kinds of numbers. These numbers are exact and inexact numbers. Exact numbers are precise values found in formulas or in conversion factors. For example, exactly 10 millimeters is equal to 1 centimeter. There are no hidden decimals or fractions, but rather a perfect 10. Likewise, in a molecule of oxygen, there are precisely two atoms of oxygen, no more, no less. Inexact numbers are values that are measured with equipment, such as rulers or graduated cylinders. They are considered inexact due to the limitations of the lab equipment. Take, for example, a piece of wood that reads 16.2 grams on a scale. The piece of wood could actually be 16.23 grams, but the scale is not accurate enough to provide that second value after the decimal. Alternatively, the sample could actually weigh 16.19 grams, but once again, the inaccuracy of the scale restricts it from providing an accurate measurement. Significant figures are digits within a measured number that have value. Significant figures are present in inexact numbers, that is, numbers that are measured from equipment or tools, collected from a report, or involved in any calculations using inexact numbers. For collected numbers, which are any numbers measured by an instrument, your final measurement should always have one more estimated digit beyond the equipment's restrictions, even if that number is a zero. In the example provided above, notice how the ruler measures only centimeters. Although this is an unlikely occurrence, your measurement would have to include an estimation beyond what the ruler can measure. We can then estimate that the pickle is 10.5 centimeters long. When reading numbers measured by someone else previously, use the east-west rule to determine the number of significant figures. The east-west rule goes like this. Imagine a map of the United States. Notice the surrounding bodies of water, the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. If the number you're dealing with has a decimal, we can say that the decimal is present. If not, we can then say that the decimal is absent. Associate the oceans with these two possibilities. Let the Pacific represent a present decimal, and the Atlantic represent an absent decimal. In either situation, you're going to cross America. That means, when there's a decimal present, you start at the Pacific and move left to right. When the decimal is absent, you start at the Atlantic and move right to left. When reading numbers, in either direction, only start counting your significant figures at the first non-zero number. Then continue for the rest of the number and be sure to count any zeros afterward. Take this example. Suppose a feather was measured as 0 0.00860 grams. Our first step would be to determine whether or not there's a decimal present. There is, right there. Therefore, we would read this number left to right, because we'd start at the Pacific and move right to cross America. We need to look out for our first non-zero number, which ends up being 8. That leaves us with only two other significant figures, for a total of three significant figures. In our next example, we have a bowling ball whose weight measures to 5,000 grams. The decimal is absent. So we would move from the Atlantic to the Pacific and find that 5 is our only significant figure. We also focus on the number of significant figures when using measured numbers in calculations. When adding or subtracting numbers with significant figures, your answer can only have as many decimal places as the least number of decimal places in your calculation. In a situation where you're adding 10 grams to 2.5 grams, your answer would be 13 grams, because 10 grams has 0 decimal places, and 12.5 would otherwise round up. A similar rule applies for multiplication and division, but instead of the number of decimal places, our focus is on the number of significant figures. Multiplying 0 0.2 centimeters by 16 centimeters yields 3.2 square centimeters, but because 0 0.2 centimeters has one significant figure, your answer must be 3 square centimeters. Again, measured numbers are understood to be imperfect. This all comes down to the limitations of the instrument used and the ability of the person using it. When talking about a measurement, the terms accurate and precise are used to describe your results. Accuracy determines how close your measurement was to the true value. A cop pulls you over and asks you if you know how fast you were going on a freeway where the speed limit is 45 miles per hour. You tell the officer that you were going 55, which isn't true, you're going 58. You just admitted to breaking the law knowingly, which is a mistake, but hey, at least you were accurate. I'm sure he's impressed. You go on your way and remember to drive safely next time. Precision applies to a set of numbers that are closely related. Let's suppose I walk outside and check my phone to see that it's 40 degrees Fahrenheit. However, a person next to me takes out his phone and sees that it's 42 degrees Fahrenheit. Another person's phone might say it's 39 degrees Fahrenheit. All these numbers are precise because they fall close to each other. Even if the temperature is completely off, say 66 degrees Fahrenheit, the numbers are precise, just not accurate. We use a little something called percent error to tell us how off our measurement was from the accepted value. This is done with the equation seen above. 
For practice, we'll use the following situation. You have a heterogeneous mixture of salt and sand. The sample measures out to 5 grams. You put the sample through filter paper, which separates salt and sand, and measure them separately. You find the sand to be 3.4 grams and the salt to be 1.2 grams. For some reason, perhaps you might have spilled some or your equipment didn't give you a very accurate measurement, you have 0.4 grams unaccounted for, because those numbers don't add up. Using the equation for percent error, you should arrive at a value of 8%. We can also use something called percent yield, which looks like this. To tell us how close we were to the accepted value, note the differences between percent error and percent yield. Using percent yield, our answer will come out to 92%. These percentages are odd in the way they are represented. You could say that you're 8% wrong or 92% correct, but it seems that wrong and right are fundamentally black and white concepts. Think of it this way. You achieved 92% of the accepted value because 4.6 is 92% of 5. In the same way, between your answer and the accepted answer, there was a difference of 8% of the accepted value. This is due to the nature of the equations. Well, percent yield and error are respectively determined by the ratios of the answer yielded to the answer known and the difference of both values over the answer known. Now scientific notation is a whole different beast. Your numbers are going to consist of a mantissa, which is a numeric value that is greater than or equal to 1, but less than 10, a base of 10, and an exponent, which determines the actual size of your number. When putting something in scientific notation, adjust the value of the mantissa so that it is 1 or greater and less than 10. In order to do this, you must move the decimal place to the left or the right, depending on whether or not your number is less than or greater than your desired value. 6012 would translate to a value of 6.012. Doing this, you've now changed the value of the expression, which is mathematically illegal. In order for the number to retain its value, you must factor out a base of 10 with an exponent of the third power. Notice how when you multiply the numbers out, you end up with your original number. Fun fact. This works because of our base 10 number system. We have no character to represent 10. The next whole number after 9 yields an extra digit. 64 is equal to 6 tens and 4 ones. If you add base 8, 64 would represent 6 eighths and 4 ones, a value which we would represent as 52. The ancient Babylonians had a base 60 system because 60, unlike 10, is divisible by many numbers and is therefore more versatile. However, the Babylonians did not have a character used to represent 0 as they believed 0 to be nothing. They just left the space. Babylonian arithmetic actually influences our modern method of timekeeping. This is why there are 60 seconds per minute and 60 minutes per hour instead of having 100 seconds per minute or 100 minutes per hour. So why do we have a base 10? It's actually because most humans have 10 fingers, so it seems convenient for us. To multiply numbers in scientific notation, multiply the mantises and add the exponents of the bases. Then, if needed, adjust the number so that it fits the criteria of a mantisa. In division, similarly divide the mantises, but this time subtract the base's exponents. Once again, be sure that your final answer has a mantisa that is 1 or greater and less than 10, and adjust the exponent of the base. In addition to subtraction, your first step is to make the bases have the same exponent. You then add or subtract the mantises and, you guessed it, reset your number so that it has an appropriate value and base. Now, when changing the base's exponents, always increase the lesser exponent so that it is equal to the greater exponent. This means moving the decimal the appropriate number of spaces to the left in the mantisa and adding that number to the exponent. Therefore, 4.03 times 10 squared plus 2.71 is equal to 4.0571 times 10 squared. Sometimes you're given measurements in units that are not the same as the units you are solving for. In this situation, use dimensional analysis or the factor label method. The factor label method uses a conversion fraction, which is a number in one unit related to another number in another unit. In a situation where you need an answer in seconds, but only have minutes, you would use the factor label method. We know that 60 seconds is equal to a minute, and that any fraction where the numerator has equal value to the denominator is equal to 1. Therefore, we know that we are not illegally changing the expression's value, but the units which it is represented by. So how should we write it then, if it doesn't matter? In the situation I gave, you're starting off with a value of minutes. Because you want the conversion to yield seconds, you would put 60 seconds in the numerator and 1 minute in the denominator. This way, the labels factor out, hence the name, factor label method. Note that any numbers used within the conversion fractions themselves are exact numbers, so they follow no rules of significant figures. We use the factor label method to eliminate all unneeded units, 
in favor of needed units, such as the example I just provided where the answer was needed in seconds despite you only having minutes. Oftentimes you'll be calculating mass, distance, or volume, and you'll be dealing with the metric system. Converting between the metric system is actually pretty simple, so long as you remember that King Henry died by drinking chocolate milk. Although this is not a historical fact, or at least we are led to believe that it is a historical fact, this serves as a great way to remember the prefixes used in the metric system. These letters represent kilo, hecto, deca, base, deci, centi, and milli. Each letter is 10 times greater or lesser than the one next to it. Kilo is 1,000, hecto is 100, deca is 10, base is 1, deci is 1 10th, centi is 100th, and milli is 1,000th. If I had 5 millimeters and I wanted to get the hectometers, I would divide by 100,000 because a millimeter is 100,000th of a hectometer. If I wanted to translate kilometers to decameters, I would multiply by 100 because 1 kilometer is equal to 100 decameters. In my last video, I talked about how mass is the measurement of material within an object and volume is the measurement of how much space an object takes up. Of course, you can find a link to all my chemistry videos in the description. Weight is the pull of gravity on the mass of an object, so the mass of an object is typically measured with the balance. Volume is measured according to its state. The volume of geometric solids can be found by using the dimensions of the object in an equation. The method typically used for regularly shaped objects is water displacement, where the volume of water is recorded both before and after the object is placed in it. The difference is then recorded as the volume of the object. For liquids, volume would be measured with a graduated cylinder. Some liquids, like water, have a higher surface tension than others. That's a topic for another time, but just know that in situations where a graduated cylinder looks something like this, you want to be measuring from the bottom of the curve, not the top. The volume of gas is dependent on the temperature and pressure of the gas, but once again, that'll be in a future video. Density is an intensive property that measures a substance's mass to volume ratio. This is the equation of density. It can be rearranged to provide the values of mass and volume, so long as you at least know two of the variables. Water, for example, has a density of 1 gram per centimeter cubed. A liter of water will measure to 1,000 grams or 1 kilogram. This is because 1 milliliter of water is equal to 1 cubic centimeter. Objects that have a density higher than 1 gram per cubic centimeter will sink in water, and objects with a density lower than 1 gram per cubic centimeter will float in water. This is why icebergs are able to float on water, despite being so heavy. Their mass remains the same, but water expands as it freezes, so its volume increases. This means the denominator is larger than the numerator, making the density less than 1. So to recap, we learned that there are inexact and exact numbers in science, and that we use significant figures because the factors of human error and inaccurate equipment are always present. We learned that we can determine how close or distant from the accepted answer we are, using percent error and percent yield, as well as how to put numbers in scientific notation, convert numbers using dimensional analysis, and calculate density. Next time, we'll be going over the atom, and again, as always, you can find a link to more chemistry videos in the description.